I would do anything for you, Chuck. What if that's wrong? Hey, Upper East Siders. Let's talk about one of the most infamous couples of modern TV history, Chuck and Blair. Much of Gossip Girl focuses on Chuck Bass and Blair Waldorf's seemingly endless cycle of falling in love, breaking up, trying to destroy each other's lives, you versus you. No limits. and falling in love again. Why are viewers so compelled by their toxic love, and why does it make so much sense that they end up together? In this couple's case, it's not just the classic will-they-won't-they they structure of TV relationships that sucks us into the vicious, addictive cycle. While there's a lot of rhetoric about Chuck somehow proving himself to Blair, Maybe I'm actually growing up after all. Chuck actually doesn't become deserving of Blair by reforming himself. The truth is that the two already deserve each other, in the worst ways. This toxic pair belongs together because no one is as cruel and manipulative as them, or as good at being terrible with style. And it's no accident because to be the king and queen of this world, they have to rule with an iron fist. Will you go to war with me? I thought you'd never ask. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell to be notified about all of our new videos. At the beginning of Gossip Girl, Blair and Nate are trying their hardest to embody their parents' expectations and have a storybook romance. But as they soon learn, Blair has much more in common with Nate's best friend, Chuck. So what exactly makes Chuck and Blair two kindred spirits? Where Nate is earnest and naive, Chuck and Blair are both extremely manipulative and trade in secrets. They enjoy being people who control the flow of information and who use their knowledge to wield power over others. you Blair Waldorf. Punishment is your middle name. Their similarities are clear from the pilot, where both Chuck and Blair take advantage of ingenue Jenny Humphrey in different ways. Blair, by using Jenny's calligraphy skills to make invitations for her party, one of the girls in my art class saw my calligraphy, and she said that if I addressed all the invitations, that I could have one. And Chuck, by assaulting a drunk Jenny at the party. Chuck and Blair are both very misanthropic and ultra-elitist. They're uninterested in the company of most other people, whom they feel don't have the necessary power, intelligence, or skills to be worthy of their time. Yet, despite hating most people, they share a common soft spot for Nate, whom both feel compelled to protect at various points. Nate was born into their world, but isn't truly suited to the manipulation and control it demands. It looks like uh, you're taking care of business, as discussed. <laughs> Dad, not everything in life's a business deal. I haven't talked to me in 30 years. Yet since he's been a fixture of both of their lives since childhood, as Chuck's childhood best friend and Blair's first boyfriend, their attachment to him is part of their attachment to tradition and the Upper East Side world they all inhabit. They seem to romanticize Nate, as if his gentlemanly demeanor, good looks, and innate sweetness are a reflection of how they like to think of their shared elite society. Blair's view of Nate, especially at the start, is even reminiscent of how Scarlet and Gone with the Wind idealizes the classic Southern gentleman character Ashley, while Chuck mirrors that story's conniving realist Rhett Butler. Sir, you are no gentleman. Ultimately, Ashley is a symbol of a fading world that never really existed as imagined by Scarlet. I've loved something that, that doesn't really exist. And Nate, as a symbol of the truly better or deserving elite, is likewise empty. As a person, he's pretty average and can only stay on top thanks to the protection of dirtier, cutthroat peers like Chuck and Blair. Most importantly, Chuck and Blair have similar relationships to the wealth and privilege that spawned them. They're the ultimate insiders who enjoy and would never apologize for what they've been given, who seem to genuinely feel that they deserve it because they're truly better than others. They're defined by conflict-ridden, oppositional relationships with their parents. You opened your heart to Blair, and it made you weak. Simultaneously pushing back against their parents' expectations while ultimately seeking their approval. Blair's mother often insults her daughter and forces her to work insanely hard in order to earn her approval. If you're gonna wear one of my designs, tell me so we can at least get it properly fitted. Thanks, Mom. Chuck's father, Bart, sets an example for his son as the ultimate schemer and manipulator. You know, I knew you were cold and ruthless, but I never thought you'd try to kill your own son. He models the deep selfishness and cruelty that defines Chuck throughout the series, taking these qualities to an absurd extreme. Are you threatening Blair with physical harm? I can't help it if accidents happen. And as soapy or over-the-top as it all is, Chuck's and Blair's combative family situations capture an interesting contradiction for young elites. 
While their family's wealth makes many things far easier for their children, wealth and status-obsessed parents can hold their children to impossibly high expectations, prompting achievement-oriented cycles of abuse that make these young people's lives feel pretty hard. You will never be more beautiful or thin or happy than you are right now. It's the kind of dynamic that demands too perfect children, which leads some to even classify affluence as a risk factor for children, and which contributes to practices like the widespread bribery of colleges to get privileged children admission. Succession similarly explores how the narcissism of incredibly wealthy people can manifest in parental bullying. Do some good things. Do good things. Be a nurse. It's worth keeping in mind that when we meet these characters, they're in high school. And while they've already been taught to act like masters of the universe, that's inevitably going to lead to immature children behaving pretty badly as they wield far more power than they know how to handle. At various points, both Chuck and Blair try to escape from their lives, including Chuck eventually adopting a fake identity. I realized I might be alive, but Chuck Bass doesn't have to be. But inexorably, they're drawn back to the Upper East Side. By the end of the series, Chuck and Blair have literally made a pact that they cannot be together until they have defeated their respective parents in the realm of business and manipulation. We made a pact. We have things we need to do on our own. But when we were both in that next place, we will be together for good. Once the pact has been resolved, they're finally able to be together as adults, taking the place of their parents. The story of Chuck and Blair's relationship is the story of both of them coming to accept their backgrounds and their families, and going on to repeat the cycle. We do belong together. We're both sick and twisted. At least we won't be lonely in hell. In some ways, Chuck and Blair are a textbook example of the classic TV will-they-won't-they they formula, where a series finds artificial reasons to separate two characters with obvious romantic chemistry over and over in order to keep viewers on the hook. But normally, will-they-won't-they they relationships are depicted as epic romances between two people who are so clearly destined to be together that the audience will root for them as long as it takes for them to be ready. The Chuck and Blair relationship, on the other hand, is about two people who hurt each other over and over again in pretty appalling ways. Thought that the worst thing you would ever do would be to me. They take the on again, off again relationship model to a destructive, abusive extreme. Gossip Girl cements Chuck and Blair as endgame in the second season, reorienting the characters to be largely focused on this relationship. We're inevitable, Waldorf. But after this point, Gossip Girl still has to drag out their relationship for seasons three through six, about two thirds of the entire length of the show. So the middle phase of the relationship is largely filled with them reiterating through words and actions that they hate each other. I hate you. I've never hated anyone more. Every nerve ending in my body is electrified by hatred. In just one example of extensive verbal abuse, Chuck tells Blair he isn't interested because she isn't untouched, and literally compares her to an animal. But now you're like one of the Arabians my father used to own. Rode hard and put away wet. I don't want you anymore. They repeatedly exploit each other, like Blair using Chuck so she can give a special toast at NYU Parents Weekend. They use romantic conquests to make each other jealous. You and I both know this guy's just a prop you bought to try to hurt me. And voice that they want to make each other suffer. Most absurdly, in a twist on indecent proposal, Chuck offers Blair up to his Uncle Jack, literally pimping out his girlfriend in exchange for the hotel business. I told Chuck I'd take either you or the hotel. He chose to give me you. This manipulation feels even outside the bounds of what Chuck has previously considered fair play in their cat and mouse game. And he intentionally keeps Blair in the dark about it. Then, once they've managed to make up and recover from even this betrayal, Blair discovers that Chuck slept with Jenny Humphrey, who had become one of Blair's worst enemies. Humphrey was don't, don't say your name! Or anything else to me, ever again. The show's need to keep the relationship going but not resolved forces Gossip Girl to cannibalize several romantic comedy tropes, like Chuck waiting for Blair at the top of the Empire State Building, a la An Affair to Remember and Sleepless in Seattle. Or Chuck and Blair having an all-out war that echoes movies like Ten Things I Hate About You or Something's Gotta Give. This means war, Blair. Blair literally marries a prince after promising God that she would do it if Chuck survived a car crash. And much of their relationship centers on whether Chuck will say, I love you, a sitcom relationship trope that helps further prolong their separation after the first season. Three words. 
Eight letters. Say it, and I'm yours. Chuck's hesitation about voicing his feelings becomes a running part of their relationship, dragging things out to a point where their eventual wedding sounds like the two of them solving a crossword puzzle. Three words, eight letters. Slayer, do you take Chuck to be your lawfully wedded husband? One word, three letters, yes. Drawing on all these shorthands for outsized romance uses our fondness for older versions of these tropes to get us invested in the idea of the relationship, instead of thinking too deeply about the reality of them as a couple. Chuck and Blair likewise focus on the idea of their relationship, talking about it in sweeping terms as if they were Sam and Diane, Ross and Rachel, or Jim and Pam. And the show wants us to similarly immortalize them. So the next time you forget, you're Blair Waldorf. Remember, I'm Chuck Bass. And I love you. This method worked, given how many fans continue to make GIFs and fanfiction about them. Chuck and Blair have won several popularity polls for titles like TV's Hottest Couple, which is sort of alarming when you consider just how painful and mutually destructive their relationship can be. So on this level, they're proof that how you frame a romance is everything, and people will accept the idea of anyone as fated soulmates if they're packaged in the right way. Blair and Chuck both have other relationships during the series, only one truly plausible off-ramp shows up. Blair's surprising late series relationship with Dan. The kind of opposites you do not attract. Most definitely not. At the time, Blair's relationship with Dan was widely hated by fans and viewed as a misstep for the show, like the last-minute Friends attempt to pair Rachel and Joey. But over time, it's been critically reevaluated. While at first their relationship feels like the show is simply trying out the last few romantic pairings it hasn't done, it turns out Dan and Blair work well together. Not only do they have shared interests in culture and literature, but they also both display a snooty attitude about their own preferences. Dan and Blair even have a more genuine meet-cute and enemies-to-lovers arc than Blair and Chuck. Nothing says January, like a brand new Cold War. I told Chuck he doesn't have my heart anymore. I realized it belongs to someone else. When both of them get internships at W Magazine, they're fiercely competitive because they share similar ambitions and similar aptitudes for achieving them. Give it up, Blair. I'm actually good at this. Through this relationship, we see a version of Blair with more human potential, who appreciates art, beauty, and sensitivity. She's still as snobby and elitist as ever, just as Dan is, but she cares about proving herself through hard work and individual achievement, not just by claiming power she's born into. In sharp contrast to her dynamic with Chuck, Blair never feels compelled to engage in manipulation in her relationship with Dan. As actress Leighton Meester herself put it, I think she kind of is her real self with him. Likewise, in an interview with E!, actor Penn Badgley described Blair as Dan's soulmate. Eventually, though, Blair is forced to make a choice between Dan and Chuck, and after accidentally proving how good Dan would be for Blair, this series has to justify why Blair should choose Chuck. There are several reasons Blair rejects Dan, but perhaps the most important is her need to be with someone of the same social caste. Chuck is one of us, whereas Dan, despite his years of trying, never will be. Blair wants someone who truly belongs in her rarefied, cruel world. Though in the end, it's an ironic reason to dump Dan, given that he's revealed to be Gossip Girl, the cruel puppet master behind the entire series. Dan, I cannot believe you are the one responsible for all of this poison. In its finale, the series tries to frame Dan's secret as a love letter to Serena and the entire Upper East Side, but the final twist actually reframes his character as being ultimately the most manipulative character on the series. So, Dan is a version of Blair who's better at Blair's game than she is, even though he rose up from what she considers a lesser background. In the end, it's that origin, more than anything, which makes him lose her to Chuck. And through her decision to choose the guy with the best birthright, that potential more human Blair we glimpsed fades away, and the show doubles down on its most cynical version of who Blair really is. Moreover, a big function of the choice between Dan and Chuck and the whole Blair-Dan pairing is really proving that Chuck is redeemable. I am so sorry for the pain I've caused you. And I know I can't take it back, but I want to try and make it up to you. This bad boy redemption arc is one of the most romantic tropes that Gossip Girl most buys into, and it's all the more striking when you consider that Chuck does many, many legitimately terrible things throughout the show. His primary character trait in the pilot is an explicit lack of respect for women's boundaries. If it's Chuck, it's 
not okay. At the series' first party, Chuck is in the process of sexually assaulting Jenny Humphrey before Dan and Serena arrive to stop him. He also briefly tries to force himself on Serena. Chuck then cleans himself up and seemingly becomes a kind person in order to prove that he deserves Blair. But is he actually any better by the end of the series? Not really. Chuck is still essentially the same person, just one who's ever so slightly widened the small circle of people he cares about. The same thing Blair herself has done over the course of Gossip Girl. The series uses Chuck's and Blair's relationship to paper over all of Chuck's crimes, from attempted rape to abusing the people he loves. I can't let my feelings cost me all that I've built. Even if it means losing me instead. Chuck repeatedly insists that he's reformed, only to fall back into his old ways. But even this whole performance of periodically attempting to become a better person, and thus getting a pass for all one's bad deeds, is a learned habit, something he picked up from his amoral father. Though Chuck hates Bart, he's similar to his father in all of the worst ways. Serena's mother, and then Bart's wife, Lily, talks about Bart the same way Blair talks about Chuck. Charles, I know you're upset that your father took his company back, but give him a chance. He did risk his life to save yours, and he's not the man he used to be." Eventually, though, the show concentrates all of the cruelty of the main cast in the cartoonishly evil figure of Bart, who becomes a scapegoat to excuse everyone else. When finally vanquished, Bart somehow leaves everyone pure and in the clear. After he's gone, Chuck and Blair are ready to be together, all of the rough parts of their relationship reduced to silly obstacles. Even the ultimate betrayal, Chuck's willingness to trade Blair to his uncle, is transformed into a source of humor. Blair, you can come on out. Uncle Jack's here to help. As much as Gossip Girl tries to present Chuck and Blair's relationship as an epic romance in which Chuck becomes someone worth marrying, the truth is that both of them grow up to be their parents, just like everyone else on the show. In order to claim her birthright, Blair rejects the opportunity to remake herself, and ultimately convinces Serena to do the same thing. The invention is for starlets from trailer parks who want to be you. When Chuck and Blair do finally get married, it's to gain spousal privilege after Chuck's father dies for real, in a quasi-accident that Chuck allows to happen. Spousal privilege means that a wife cannot be forced to testify against her husband. The picture-perfect ending of Chuck and Blair's subsequent family in the future rests on a foundation of violence. But this is really just the capstone on a relationship built on the backs of everyone they have destroyed along the way. The Bass-Waldorf wedding is supposed to be the catharsis the audience has been seeking, and finally giving us what we want. But it might be better to think of Chuck and Blair as a tragedy, not so much for them as for us, and for anyone who has to live in Chuck and Blair's world. We were just playing chess, and she was another piece that you needed to knock over on your way to take the queen. This is the take on your favorite movie shows and pop culture. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe.